Hello, everybody, and welcome to ICDA uh, Plenary Session 1A, which is Genetic Maps uh, for Maps to Mechanism to Medicine. My name is Imer Kenny, and I will be moderating this session. Uh, in this session, we've got four fantastic speakers, and each speaker will be given 15 minutes approximately to speak, followed by about five minutes for questions and answers. Please use the chat box on the side of your screen to post or upvote questions, uh, which I will read out at the end of the talk. I particularly encourage trainees to ask questions, and there's also an active Slack channel, which can be accessed by the link at the top of the page. For the next 15 minutes, I'm going to talk to you about how we are trying to bridge the gap between the genome and clinical phenotypes, or even looking at clinical phenotypes independent of genetics. The principal task of, of human genetics is the study of human diversity. And the part of human diversity that we are particularly interested in is the is the diversity in risk of disease and response to treatment. And, and this includes all aspects of human diversity that may indirectly affect the risk of disease and response to treatment. And that basically covers almost all of human diversity. And keep in mind when you are when you're mining data on human diversity, you are, you are mining data from an experiment that has been taking place for the past 250,000 years. This all begins with diversity in the sequence of ACGs and Ts in the genome, but then we have to go from the genome to the clinical phenotype, and all of us have been struggling with what to do when we find a variant in the, in the genome that associates with risk of disease, and the variant isn't in a gene, so what, is the, what should we do next? And one of the things that we can always do is to go from the genomic data to transcriptomic data, how much of RNA, what kind of a splice form of RNA, and then we can also go and take a look at level of proteins in blood affected by variants in the genome, and then we take, can take it all back to the disease in question. And I'm going to give you one example of a disease where we applied genomic, transcriptomics, and proteomics to shed la light on the nature of the disease. And the disease I'm, I'm, I'm uh, taking as an example is an autoimmune thyroid disease. And it is the most common autoimmune disease of man. It affects about 5% of the population. It is characterized by thyroid autoantibodies and lymphocytic infiltration of the thyroid. And the major subtypes of autoimmune thyroid disease are Graves' disease and Hashimoto thyroiditis. And what, what we uh, used of data are first and foremost 30,000 cases and about 725,000 controls, and then very substantial data on diversity in the sequence. We had RNA-seq data on about 17,000 individuals, we had plasma proteins measured in, in blood in about 40,000 individuals, and we brought this all to the study of autoimmune thyroid disease. And we started off with a meta-analysis of, of the association of variants in the genome with the disease using both the cases from Iceland and the UK Biobank, now, this yielded 99 uh, sequence variants at 93 loci, of which 84 were novel. And the variant with the biggest effect was an intronic variant in the FLT3 gene. And remember, FLT3 is a receptor tyrosine kinase that affects the existence and, and the function of various lymphoid cells. But in addition to associating with, with autoimmune thyroid disease, with an odds ratio of 1.46. It associated also with other autoantibody positive um, uh, uh, inflammatory diseases like systemic lupus erythematosus and antibody positive rheumatoid arthritis. But also of great importance for our story is that it had been that it associates with, with uh, acute myeloid leukemia with an odds ratio of 1.9. 
And, and this is interesting because it had previously been shown that a, that a, a gain-of-function variant in uh, a gain-of-function variant in the FLT3 gene uh, correlated with uh, acute myeloid leukemia uh, that is particularly malignant. The next thing we did is that we took this intronic variant in the FLT3 gene and we looked at our, our RNA-seq data. And we found that it generates a cryptic splice site that leads to abnormal splicing of about 30% of the transcript. And remember, the FLT3 is a receptor tyrosine kinase, and, and uh, the variant yielded basically uh, a transcript missing the, the, the tyrosine kinase domain. So this basically looked like a loss of function variant, it, which is somewhat puzzling because of the association with acute myeloid leukemia, because it had previously been shown that the gain of function variant in that particular disease associate with, with uh, acute myeloid leukemia. So the next thing we then did is that we took the variant and we looked at the impact it has on the level of proteins in plasma. And indeed, this variant associates with almost doubling the level of the lichen for FLT3. The FLT3 lichen was increased by almost 100% in level in blood. So basically what we have done is that we had found an intronic variant in the FLT3 gene that associates with increased risk of autoimmune thyroiditis, increased risk of several other uh, anti autoantibody positive autoimmune diseases associated with increased monocyte count, and it generated a cryptic splice site leading to abnormal splicing, leading to truncated protein, but in, it also associated with a considerable increase in the level of the lichen for the FLT3. So this loss of function mutation in the FLT3 gene led to a compensatory increase in the level of the lichen for the receptor, such that the pathobiological outcome of this loss of function variant was indeed a gain of function. So this is one example of, of how you can increase the depth of your understanding of a disease like this by looking at not just genomics, but also transcriptomics and proteomics. But this is an ex example of how you can use these three categories of data to shed light on a disease where everything is driven by the variant in the genome. But indeed, most of the diseases that we are interested in have not just genomic or genetic component to the risk, but also environmental component to the risk. So, and, and we are missing a systematic way of looking for environmental influences. But it is, has to be kept in mind that the proteins are the business molecule in our body. The proteins are the, are the things that make everything else. So it is not likely that dramatic effects of the environment on the body would take place without having some impact on the proteome. So we have taken the, we, we have taken the stance of, of looking at the proteins as one of the ways in which one can capture environmental influences. It is important to keep in mind when you look at the proteomics that you that it is dangerous to make assumptions about how the variants in the genomes we're looking at, uh, how they are mediating their effect. And, and for example, when we find a, a coding sequence variant, rare coding sequence variants in a gene, we have a tendency, tendency to assume that the effect is mediated through the protein made by the gene. But I have one uh, example that I'm particularly fond of, which is the way in which the APOE affects the risk of Alzheimer's disease. And, and actually, if you look at the coating uh, sequence variant in APOE, they affect level of about 62 proteins. So it is very dangerous to assume that the coating sequence variant in the APOE gene affect the risk of, of Alzheimer's disease through APOE itself. And we have actually data that indicate that that effect is mediated through some other proteins. One of the things that is important to keep in mind is that as we grow older, 
The environment has had bigger uh, opportunity to affect us. We are stuck pretty much with the same variants in the germline genome from conception to death, but the environment continues to hammer us uh, throughout our life. And, and um, in, in the context of, of the idea that the proteome can serve as a big net with which to catch the influences of the environment, basically 81% of the, of the proteins in blood uh, correlate with age, uh, 63% positively, and 80, 18% of them negatively. Let's now take one example of how one can use uh, the proteome to predict the state of health of individuals. And basically, one of the studies we did is that we took a, a plasma from about 23,000 individuals, plasma that was collected 15 to 20 years ago. And among those 23,000 individuals, there had been about 7,380 deaths. But the total number of follow-up years in that group was 307,000 years. And actually, based on the use of, of uh, between one and 200 proteins used in a machine learning algorithm to predict the, what is left of life, we could basically find 5% of people between the ages of, of uh, 60 and 80 who had about 88% probability of dying within the next 10 years. And we could find another 5% who had virtually no probability of dying within the next 10 years. And it's interesting that the, the, it didn't matter from what cause the, these people died. Uh, mostly the same proteins were at the top of the list of proteins that allowed us to make this prediction, with a subtle exception from death from nervous system diseases. But one thing that is particularly interesting is that when we take this algorithm, we could show that your grip strength was inversely correlated with the number of years you were predicted to have left of life. The, the shorter life you were pre predicted to have left, the worse you performed on exercise tolerance test, and the worse you performed on test of cognitive function. So you could argue that this proteomic algorithm that we used uh, was a good predictor of human frailty in general. Another example I want to give you of how you can use the proteomic data to um, dive into uh, the basic mechanism behind disease, the onset of disease and the progression of disease, was, the, was our use of a polygenic uh, risk score versus proteomic risk score for cardiovascular disease in a large cohort in Iceland. And I'm not going to go into the way in which we used the polygenic risk score. It was based on the most recent biggest meta-analysis of, of um, cardiovascular disease. And the proteomic score we used based on about 10,000 uh, Icelanders with, with cardiovascular disease. And basically what we demonstrated when we are using on one hand polygenic risk score, on the other hand proteomic risk score, for um, cardiovascular disease is that per standard deviation of the polygenic grid score, we could capture a hazard ratio of 1.21, but with a, a standard deviation in the proteomic risk score, we could capture hazard ratio 2.27. So the proteomic score could capture much, much larger risk than polygenic grid score, which is not necessarily surprising because the polygenic risk score is based on, on um, the variants in the genome that are there from conception to death. But the proteome continues to change throughout life and changes as a consequence of diseases and, and uh, all kinds of environmental exposure. What makes this particularly interesting is not just that the proteomic score captures much more risk than the polygenic risk score, it, but also that there was a very little correlation between the proteomic score and the polygenic risk score. And, and this is particularly interesting because what you are probably looking at in the proteomic risk score is not a true risk score. 
you are probably documenting the early events in the pathogenesis of the disease. And, and what is interesting in that context is that once the pathogenesis begins, there, it looks like there are processes that take over that are somewhat independent of the genetics. And, and uh, we have several examples, not just in the cardiovascular disease, we have examples from Alzheimer's disease, etc., which tells us that the basic mechanisms behind the onset of a disease can be almost completely separated from the processes that lead to progression. And I think that our task in the near future is to gather much, much more data on progression of disease and, and be aware of the fact that we may be studying things that are fairly separate and distinct from, from uh, processes that lead to onset. And thank you. Uh, we have a few minutes so we can ask some of the questions that have come in through the chat box. So I'll start with the question uh, from Michael Nagel, um, who is talking about some of the APOL, APOE uh, work you discussed. Are these studies for APOE PQTLs performed in cohorts with Alzheimer's study uh, subjects? Could this confound the result for the SNP given the high risk of association of the variant? I, I, this is not, this was not done in, in people with cohort with Alzheimer's disease. This was done on people who were relatively healthy when we recruited them. All right. These are the 30, we recruited altogether 39,000 people to, that we did uh, uh, the proteomics one, 23,000 of them were, were recruited about 15 to 20 years ago. And, and they were certainly not Alzheimer's cohort. Thank you. Uh, the next question is from Mike Pazin. Is the FLT3 entronic variant a dominant negative for some related receptor tyrosine kinases, truncations that combined ligand and dimerize inhibit the function of wild type receptors that bind the same ligand? Yeah, I, we have no evidence of that, but it is plausible. Great. Um, and a few questions coming in from uh, anonymous, anonymous folks. Um, I'm just taking one at random. Uh, you discussed proteins and their relation to age. What proportion of proteins associate with sex? And do you see sexual dimorphism in your PQTLs? There is a sexual dimorphism, yes. Uh, there is um, in the sense that the uh, very last percentage of the proteins is in higher level in males than females. Mm -hmm. but there's a, a subset that is higher in females than males. And uh, there, are, there are definitely sexual dimorphism. And, and, um, yeah, and, and actually, when you begin to look at uh, proteins in a large number of, of individuals, you end up seeing you know, proteins that, uh, for example, that are the levels that change with pregnancy and stuff like that. There's uh, all kinds of... of um, information you can extract out of this and some of them have to do with the difference between males and females. Fantastic, fascinating work. Um, so we're a little out of time now. If For those whose questions I didn't get to, please uh, take them over to the Slack channel and we'll move on to our next speaker, uh, who is Leah Davis. Thank you so much, Emer. I'm delighted to have the opportunity to share the work that's ongoing in the Psych Emerge Network with the ICDA. Um, so by way of introduction, uh, the Psych Emerge Network began in 2018 at three academic medical centers, Vanderbilt, uh, Massachusetts General Hospital, and Geisinger Health Center with collaborators Jordan Smoller and Chris Shibri. And our goal really was to use electronic health records linked with genetic data to further psychiatric genetics research. So within just a few months, the uh, PsychEmerge network grew and we now have um, over 21 sites and affiliated partners, including um, international partners. So the network is built on an existing collaborative infrastructure of the eMERGE network, the Electronic Medical Records and Genomics Network. Uh, 
and PsychEmerge, of course, has a focus on mental health and psychiatric conditions, but we also operate a little differently from the original eMERGE network in that we use a federated analytic approach instead of a centralized data approach. So instead of bringing our data together, we bring the scientists together to develop centralized pipelines that then get deployed locally so that the results can then be meta-analyzed across sites. And there are two really fantastic things that come out of this. The first is that we're able to pretty quickly and efficiently um, include hundreds of thousands of samples, which allow us to work at the scale needed to understand the complex and nuanced biology that we're attempting to unravel. And the second is that we really learn so much from each other. And this kind of egalitarian approach to the research has really been a tenant of the consortium from the beginning. We recognize that the kinds of problems that we want to tackle are much bigger than any of us can, um, can approach on our own. And so we encourage ourselves and each other to share what we know, but also to be vulnerable and open about what we don't know. And this, I think, really helps to create an atmosphere of intellectual honesty, where investigators at all career levels with different backgrounds can really contribute meaningfully, and it very much enriches the network. So in total now, we have a partnership across, as I said, 21 academic medical centers, registries, and partner sites with over 80 collaborating members, and this includes geneticists, data scientists, psychiatrists, psychologists, um, statisticians, project managers, software developers, ethicists, students, faculty, and staff. We have access to over 15 million EHRs across the network and almost a million genotyped patients. So briefly, I just wanted to mention um, some of the data types uh, that are available across the record. Typically in the EHR, we have access to billing codes, which are recorded to indicate the reason for the clinical visit, um, clinical communications or notes between care providers, um, billing codes for procedures, medications that are prescribed, narrative notes that the provider enters about the clinical encounter, emergency room visits, lab and path, uh, pathology tests and results, and finally inpatient visits. So there's a lot of action happening in this slide, and the point I want to make with this is that the health record is very dynamic. It's constantly being updated and touched by many hands. And so while the record itself is structured and electronic, behind that structure is really a very fundamentally human process. And it's important to keep that in mind. Oh, here we go. OK. So in one of our first studies, we explored whether the polygenic risk score for schizophrenia was associated with a clinical schizophrenia diagnosis across four psychemerge sites. And what we observed, perhaps not surprisingly, was that the score was significantly associated, uh, correlated with the odds of a schizophrenia diagnosis. But what I want to point out is that the development of schizophrenia is still a relatively rare event. So even though the polygenic score itself is a risk factor, it's certainly not fully predictive, as a lot of people with a high polygenic score will never go on to develop schizophrenia. But then taking advantage of the rest of the diagnoses in the medical record, as Mark mentioned before, that's one of the, uh, the real you know, benefits of using the EHR, we also conduct a phenome-wide association study of the polygenic score. So a phenome-wide association study is sort of an inverse of a genome-wide association study, where instead of comparing cases and controls for one phenotype at every position in the genome, here we are taking one single polygenic score and asking, is it higher or lower on average for cases or controls across about 1,500 phenotypes? So these studies are performed on everybody in the biobank, regardless of whether they have schizophrenia or not. And we do this in a regression framework to adjust for standard covariates, including age, sex, and principal components generated from the genetic data. And in this Manhattan plot, you can see that each dot represents a phenotype. The phenotypes are organized on the x-axis by domain, and the y-axis reflects the negative log uh, 10 of the p-value. 
Um, and so here we can see a peak of uh, psychiatric diagnoses associated with the schizophrenia risk score, which remains even after we adjust for the presence of psychosis within the sample, which was um, you know, a, a low frequency but was present. So when we adjust for the presence of psychosis, we lose those associations with schizophrenia and psychosis, as we would expect. Um, and we also adjusted for the presence of any antipsychotic medication. Um, and so it, we were quite interested to see that we maintain associations with many of these psychiatric conditions and also with um, metabolic conditions and some genitourinary conditions. We performed a similar analysis for um, the major depression polygenic risk score. And again, we see a similar sizable peak in the psychiatric diagnostic category. And we see additional associations with cardiovascular, respiratory, and digestive conditions. And again, when we adjust for the presence of major depression, which of course is much more common um, in our uh, EHR, so we adjusted for the, the presence of major depression, but also um, additional depressive diagnoses, we see still this association with anxiety disorder, um, bipolar disorder, um, and an enrichment in um, coronary artery conditions and ischemic heart disease. And so, in fact, for every polygenic score that we've tested, we actually observe the greatest odds ratio for the referent phenotype. And even when we control for the clinical diagnosis of that condition, we still see widespread association across the phenome. But the patterns are very different. And so typically what we see is depression associated with cardiovascular disease at the genetic level, anxiety and asthma, schizophrenia and metabolic conditions, and chronic pain and PTSD. And we think that these patterns are actually pointing us to relevant biology. And this really further confirmed an idea that has been gaining momentum for a long time, which is that both widespread pleiotropy and comorbidity are the rule, not the exception here. Now, keep in mind that we're working with a biobank population, which is enriched for long records. On average, our biobank uh, samples have a, a EHR record length of about 10 years. And this is including primary, secondary, and tertiary care. And so we're seeing the, accumulate, the cumulative effects um, over many years. So one question that we asked was whether we could take advantage of the quantitative longitudinal data that's accumulated during the lifetime um, to make use of these existing biomarkers and potentially learn more about the biological development of psychiatric conditions um, as they're also related with many other phenotypes in the EHR. And again, it's important to keep in mind that in our population, people will receive labs either as a matter of establishing their baselines or when there's a suspicion of disease, or when disease has actually been diagnosed and needs to be monitored. Now, anyone who's spent any time working with labs in the EHR knows how messy this data is, and I won't bore you with the details, but I do want to just mention that we spent about two and a half years wrangling the labs from the EHR and developing tools for cleaning, harmonization, and analyses of these labs. And so these tools, Quality Lab and LabWAS, are available in our Bitbucket repositories and have now been used to clean, I'm excited to say, um, and analyze over 1.3 billion measurements on about 11,000 lab tests performed on almost 4 million patients across multiple sites in the network. And so I also want to point out that ours was not the only group working on this, and around the same time, another paper with recommendations for LabWAS was also published. Um, and so ultimately, what we were interested in doing here was combining the clinical lab data with the available genomic data to investigate um, psychiatric genetics, and specifically the risk of major depression. So, we wanted to start, though, with a proof of principle experiment to see if we generated a polygenic score for LDL, HDL, and triglycerides in each person in the Vanderbilt Biobank, BioView, and then tested that score against all clinically lab, uh, measured labs, would we detect the referent lab? 
And indeed, we found that each polygenic score was robustly associated with the referent lab. And so I won't go into the details of those studies, but I do just quickly want to mention um, and share with you the results from a study of the genetic risk score for coronary artery disease, or CAD. So our primary question here was, can this, the genetic risk for CAD recapitulate the CAD biomarker profile? And we tested that question in our lab loss framework um, with the CAD polygenic score. So here you're looking at an analysis performed in about 70,000 individuals of primarily European ancestry in the panel on the left, and in a sample of about 15,000 individuals of primarily African ancestry in the panel on the right. And indeed, we observed association with several canonical biomarkers, um, including known risk factors like LDL, triglycerides, uh, lower HDL, but we also observed markers of heart damage uh, like troponin and BNP, which are elevated after a cardiac event. And of course, some people in this data set actually have a diagnosis of CAD. So we then co-varied for the presence of the CAD diagnosis. And what you can see is that we retain the risk profile for CAD, but we actually lose those markers of um, CAD events. Yes, and actually some of our risk um, uh, biomarkers become even more significantly associated. So then we turned to the depression polygenic score and again trained a score and deployed it in the uh, lab loss framework. Um, and this, I'm going to show you results from primarily the European ancestry analysis as there were no associations that exceeded our Bonferroni correction in the African ancestry sample. So again, we observed associations with several metabolic traits, vitamin D and multiple immune markers, um, including white blood cell count. We then adjusted for the presence of depression and anxiety diagnoses, then depression, anxiety, and adjustment reaction, and then also um, a depression, anxiety, adjustment reaction, and BMI. And we were impressed that this white blood cell marker still showed a robust association even after all of these adjustments. That said, um, it's certainly possible that we were continuing to pick up association that could be confounded with other phenotypes that people are presenting within the EHR. Depression is very common, and so we could imagine many possible ways in which genetic risk for depression could be mediated by correlated phenotypes like IBS or heart disease or even seasonal uh, allergies. And so we identified all of the phenotypes that were correlated with both the white blood cell count measurement and the polygenic risk score for depression. And those fell into seven different categories. We then adjusted our original association for each of those categories and for all of them together. And again, um, our association with the white blood cell count measurement remained robust. So we then turned to the rest of the PsychEmerge network, and within a re relatively short period of time, we were able to replicate those findings across all of our sites, which demonstrated the same degree of association with the polygenic score and white blood cell count, regardless of whether we were adjusting for depression diagnoses or other accompanying psychiatric diagnoses. So this le left us with uh, two possible um, mediation models, um, one in which uh, white blood cell count acted as a mediator between genetic risk and depression, and one in which depression acted as a mediator between genetic risk and the white blood cell count marker. And having individual level data was a real additional benefit here because we could test both, and we actually observed evidence for both, which we think supports a bi-directional model between depression and inflammation. But it's important to understand this in context. So overall, we are seeing a very modest effect of the genetic risk of depression on white blood cell measurements. Between the top decile of polygenic risk and the bottom decile of polygenic risk, it's about a 5% difference in median blood cell counts. And these values remain within the reference range for normal uh, levels. So the interpretation here is that the depression polygenic score is associated with increased but not abnormal white blood cell counts. Um, and so really our take home from this analysis is that both pleiotropy and comorbidity are widespread, but 
Also, that at a biological level, mental health is really not separable from physical health. And I think genetics really gives us a very nice framework to deepen our appreciation of this. So I am, uh, I think, out of time, and so I just want to wrap up by um, highlighting the fact that this point of view is also supported by clinical outcomes research. We know that when mental and physical health care are coordinated, there are a lot of positive benefits for patients. And when we think about going from maps to mechanisms to medicine, I think one of the real challenges in going to medicine is going to be changing the clinical culture in a way that, um, that allows us to provide more integrative care um, across all domains of medicine. And I think genetics actually provides a really nice common language for us to begin to um, engage across domains of medicine. So with that, I will um, finish. And thank you so much for um, your attention. And I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, Leah. So we're a little short on time, so I'll try and be quick. Um, one question coming in in the chat box, to what extent can the PRS pleiotropy be driven by non-biological or genetic factors, uh, such as stratification with various social and environmental variables? Yeah, I think that's a fantastic question, and it's one that we struggle with a lot, um, because you know, any time that we do a GWAS of, uh, let's say, depression, we are also then... Um, stratifying people by difficult life experiences that can be correlated with depression. Um, and so we have to be very careful to not make assumptions about you know, the underlying genetic correlation and keep in mind that this is still a correlative analysis, not a causal analysis fundamentally. Um, that said, I think the, the best we can do at this time is really to carefully include covariates for um, as much sort of uh, social and environmental um, confounding as we can. Um, and so in these analyses, we were able to adjust for things like um, edu level of education, but, um, but we had limited information on um, like income and uh, some of the other, you know, experiences of, um, of social discrimination, for example. So those are things that I think we need to be better about measuring and including in analyses. Thank you very much. Um, and we need to, uh, just for time, move on to our next speaker and encourage others to use the Slack channel to continue the conversation. Um, so next up, uh, we have Dr. Yen Fen Lin, um, whenever you're ready. Uh, so I'm, I'm Yen Fen Lin, uh, I'm from Taiwan and it's, 2 a.m. in my local time. Uh, so this is a very rare and invaluable experience for me to present publicly at that night. And I'm really grateful for the opportunity to give a presentation at the ICDF plenary. And today I'm here to present our recent work on genetic analysis of quantitative traits in the Taiwan Belt Bank. I, I, I guess most of you are not familiar with Taiwan Belt Bank. So First, I would like to give a quick overview of the TWB. The Taiwan Bell Bank is a community-based prospective cohort study of the Taiwanese population with multi-omics genomic data and longitudinal phenotypic and environmental measures. So since uh, 2012, the cohort has been enrolling men and women aged from 30 to 70 with no prior diagnosis of cancer from more than 30 recruitment sites across Taiwan distributed based on population density of different counties and cities with an expected target sample size of 200,000. And at baseline, each participant undergoes physical examinations and an interview with a well-trained interviewer to report a wide range of phenotypes and health-related information in a structured questionnaire. And here I list the phenotypes by category. There are demographics, behavioral, uh, environmental, diet, anthropometric, and medical imaging phenotypes. And the health condition related phenotypes are self-reported diseases, family history, and the results of uh, physical examinations. Blood and urine samples are also collected for biomarker testing and the generation of genomic methylation metabolomic data. And each follow-up visit uh, a repeated assessment was carried out for phenotypes measured at baseline. 
a total of more than 1,000 phenotypes have been measured. In addition to self-reported medical conditions, disease and health information can be obtained through linkage to um, Taiwan's National Health Insurance Research Database. Uh, so uh, the NHI is a single payer compulsory insurance program uh, for all citizens in Taiwan with a coverage rate over 99%. So there are also comprehensive medical claim and health insurance data available upon application to be linked to the TWB data. And here's the distribution of age, sex, and education level of study participants at baseline. More female than male participants were enrolled in TWB. And age of the participants had, uh, was evenly distributed, distributed across every 10 year age bracket. And 75% of the participants had a high school degree or higher. The most common self-reported disease is peptic ulcer with a prevalence of around 15%. The followings are GERD, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, and kidney stone. Uh, but one noticeable issue of TWB is uh, that several self-reported common diseases showed an in-sample prevalence lower than that in the general adult population. For example, the in-sample prevalence of hypertension is 12.5%, uh, while the prevalence is 26% uh, in the general Taiwanese population. But this may reflect biases from self-report or similar to what was observed in the UK Bell Bank of a healthy volunteer bias. And multi-omics data were generated for all or subsets of the participants, including genome-wide SNP genotyping, whole genome sequencing, HLA typing, DNA methylation, and the blood metabolome. The population structure of TWB is highly homogeneous, uh, comprising Taiwanese individuals of predominantly Han Chinese descent. Uh, projection of TWB onto 1,000 genome data showed a uh, tight clustering with the ES superpopulation uh, in the left PZ plot. And in the right plot, among the 1,000 genome East Asian samples, TWB subjects are clustered with the two Han Chinese population, uh, CHB and CHS. And the main results I'm going to report uh, are findings from around 100,000 individuals across 36 human quantitative traits in the Taiwan Biobank. Genotyping for the TWB was performed using two different customized genome-wide arrays. In the sample of our analysis, around uh, 27,000 participants genotyped on the TWB1 array and uh, 75,000 genotyped on the TWB2 array. The 75,000 individuals using TWB2 were divided into two subsamples. Uh, 65,000 were used as the discovery batch two, and the other 10,000 were used for polygenic risk prediction, validation, and testing. Uh, we performed GWAS for uh, uh, 36 quantitative traits, which are listed in the right panel. We also compared our result with those from Biobank Japan and the UK Biobank. The quantitative phenotypes uh, in our analysis include anthropometric traits, bone density, cardiovascular trait, blood cell majors, serum biochemical markers, and lung function measurements. So after uh, QC procedures, we performed GWAS on 36 quantitative traits with imputed genotype data. We used originally a two-step whole genome regression method for genetic association tests that accounts for sample relatedness and the population structure to perform association, association analysis on the two discovery batches separately. We used um, linear regression implemented in Virginia for association testing, controlling for age, age square, sex, age by sex interaction, age square by sex interaction, and top uh, 20 principal components. Then we meta-analyzed uh, GWAS results across the two batches. And in the middle is a Fuji plot uh, summarizing the GWAS results. And uh, LD score regression intercept and lambda GC showed that uh, there was uh, negligible inflation due to population certification, and all traits had high between batch genetic correlation estimates. <laughs> 
And we meta-analyzed the uh, discovery batch one and two GWAS using an inverse variance weighted fixed effect approach. We identified uh, 1,907 independent genome-wide significant loci across the 36 traits, among which uh, 1,287 loci survived a confirmation correction for the number of traits tested. The number of genome-wide significant loci per chat ranged from 1 for FEV1 and FEV1 to FBC ratio uh, to 211 for height. And we also estimated the SNP-based heritability for each trait. And we estimated pairwise genetic correlations between traits and the identified clusters of highly genetically correlated traits. Uh, for example, uh, body fat rate, BMI, body weight, uh, waist circumference, uh, hip circumference, and uh, weight hip ratio appear to be highly correlated. And then we implemented a summary statistics based version of SUSY. Uh, for the fine mapping analysis. Of the 1,900 loci, around 290 uh, failed to identify a reliable, credible set and the past QC threshold. And the remaining uh, 1,600 were fine mapped to a total of 1,972 credible sets, and each presenting an independent association. Uh, out of the 1,000 900 credible sets, 232 were mapped to a single variant with a posterior inclusion probability greater than 95%, among which uh, 24 were missense variants. So here we listed the 24 fine map missense variants with PIP uh, greater than uh, 0.95. All fine mapped missense variants with the corresponding GUAS available in Biobank Japan or UK Biobank uh, were replicated with the same direction of effect and the study wide significance with a p value smaller than 0.05 over 15, which is uh, 0.003. And these putative causal missense variants not only replicated previous findings, but also represented novel causal variants. Uh, for example, the uh, for, for bone marrow density, uh, there's a novel gene, uh, RREB1. And some of these high PIP missense variants were also highly pleiotropic. For example, uh, S267F in SLC uh, 10A1 gene is associated with gamma GT, LDLC, and total cholesterol, suggesting its pleiotropic role in multiple complex traits. And uh, prior studies have shown that complex traits are genetically correlated at different levels between East Asian and the European populations. But the genetic overlap within East Asian populations has not been characterized. The leveraging existing GWAS summary statistics from Biobank Japan and the UK Biobank, we investigated the comparative genetic architecture of quantitative traits uh, within East Asians, comparing uh, TWB and BBJ, and uh, uh, between East Asian and European populations, which are TWB versus UKBB and the BBJ versus UKBB. And among the 21 traits for which GWAS were available across the three bio banks, the SNP based heritability estimates in TWB were comparable with those in UKBB but consistently higher than the heritability estimates in BBJ, except for height. Uh, a possible explanation might be uh, that both TWB and UKBB are community-based, while BBJ is hospital-based, in which biomarker measurements may be affected by the health condition or medication use of the patients sampled in hospitals. Uh, when comparing within East Asian and uh, cross-ethnic uh, genetic correlations, the within uh, EAS, uh, which is TWB versus BBJ, uh, genetic correlation estimates were in general higher than TWB versus UKBB genetic correlation and uh, BBJ versus UKBB 
genetic correlation estimates. But uh, despite these differences, we know that all within uh, or cross population RG estimates were high with a median of 0.927. So taken together, these results suggested that the genetic architecture for the quantitative traits examined here was largely consistent across East Asian and the European populations. And to maximize the power for genetic discovery in ES populations, we meta-analyzed the GWAS from TWB and BBJ for 23 traits. We report a signal in the meta-analysis as novel if none of the variants within the locus reached genome-wide significance in BBJ and the UK BB GWAS. So uh, we identified a total of uh, 2,491 loci associated uh, with the 23 traits, among which uh, 579 were novel. And for the 13 traits for which BBJ GWAS were not available, we identified an additional uh, 484 genome-wide significant loci using TWB samples only, among which 400 were novel. And and we, we found many of the associated loads that were highly pleiotropic. For example, uh, TRPS1 was associated with uh, 14 uh, traits spanning the anthropometric, bone density, uh, hematological, and metabolic categories. The mechanism uh, underlying these pleiotropic associations will need to be further investigated. And with biomarker GWAS results available, we assessed the clinical utility of biomarker GWAS for disease risk prediction. We examined whether uh, polygenic risk scores of biomarkers can be used to predict the risk of common complex disease. We applied PRSCSX, a method for multi-ethnicity polygenic prediction to integrate the GWAS summary statistics of East Asian and the European ancestry and calculate both an ES specific and an EUR specific PRS for each biomarker. We then predicted five complex phenotypes, uh, including obesity, overweight, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, and type 2 diabetes in a held out TWB sample of around 10,000 individuals using a linear combination of PRS from one or more biomarkers and controlling for age, sex, and top 20 principal components. And we found uh, biomarker PRS uh, were significantly associated with disease status, explaining um, more than 8% of the variation for obesity, overweight, and uh, hypertension and 6% of the variation for type 2 diabetes and 4.3% uh, of the variation for hyperlipidemia on the liability scale. And as a comparison, we also predicted uh, type 2 diabetes using the largest to date disease GWAS in East Asians with 280,000 individuals and in Europeans with a sample size of 900,000. Uh, while the disease GWAS represented much larger sample size, uh, prediction accuracy achieved by biomarker PRS was comparable. So uh, in summary, we performed uh, genome-wide analysis on 100,000 community-based TWB participants across the 36 human complex traits. We found uh, the genetic architecture for this quantitative trait was largely consistent within EAS and between ES and EUR populations. And integrating TWB and BBJ GWAS identified a total of uh, near uh, 3,000 genetic loads, among which uh, 1,000 had not been reported in previous biomarker, uh, biobank GWAS. And we also find mapped over 200 association signals to a single variant with posterior inclusion probability greater than 95% and identified 24 putative causal missense variants. We also demonstrated the potential utility of biomarker GWAS in predicting disease risk and the promise of multi-trait cross-population polygenic prediction. And for those who are interested in using TW data, uh, our GWAS summary st statistics can only be shared with journal editor and reviewers currently during the peer review process. 
but will be shared publicly uh, without restrictions after publication. If you are interested in individ individual phenotypic and genotypic growth data, they are available upon application for research uh, purposes. And re researchers will need to submit an application including a research a proposal and an IRB approval. So for those uh, from other countries outside of Taiwan, an additional international data transfer agreement will be needed. And lastly, I would like to acknowledge the contributions and efforts of my lab members and our collaborators and the support uh, from uh, National Health Research Institute and the Ministry of Science and Technology of Taiwan. And thank you all for listening. Any comments or feedback would be appreciated. Thank you. Thank you very much for an excellent talk, this very exciting work. Um, I'm just going to hop in with moderator privilege and ask the first question. So that was very interesting analysis you showed there at the end, comparing very large type 2 diabetes studies versus HbA1c biomarker PRS in terms of predicting T2D outcome. Have you looked at that across? Do you think this is particular to T2D or an, an HbA1c is just a particularly good biomarker? Or have you looked at this across other uh, biomarkers and uh, diseases um, and, you know, thoughts about what you think will be most impactful per, for predicting health outcomes? Yeah, so to be honest, we, we, we only uh, did this for a uh, type 2 diabetes. Yeah, and we think HbA1c is kind of a, 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 a more stable biomarker than others. Mm. So we, we try this first. Yeah, yeah no, I wonder what it would be like for, for more liable markers, like, for example, cholesterol levels or, or different sort of hematological markers. Uh, well, for time, uh, we're going to have to move on for the next speaker, but thank you very much again. Thank and uh, next up, we have Dr. Sejin Fatumo, um, who uh, will be giving the last talk of the session. Hello, good morning, uh, good afternoon, and good evening, depending on where you are today. I would like to start by thanking the organizer for inviting me to make this presentation today. Thank you very much. So my name is Shego Fatumo. I'm an associate professor at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. Uh, I'm also a group leader at the African Continental Genomic Group at the MRC VRI and Station in Uganda. So the title of my presentation is Embracing African Genetic Diversity for Novel Gene Discovery and Genetic Risk Prediction. So like you're all aware, uh, genomic data from Africa individuals are scarce. Uh, most of the time when I made these statements, I like to emphasize that the human genomic data from continental Africa is very, very scarce, especially when you're comparing it to other global population. So in this presentation, uh, my aim is to demonstrate how we are maximizing the African genomic resources in Uganda uh, for novel gene discovery and polygenic uh, prediction and also I'll be proposing uh, a model in which we can narrow health inequality uh, that is currently posed by uh, genomic imbalance. Sub-Saharan Africa, like you know, is the only region, that only region in the world in which uh, a special disease, the abnormal chronic disease uh, as a cause of death. So although the burden of disease in Sub-Saharan Africa so continues to be dominated by special disease, like you know, uh, but this graph here uh, shows uh, clearly epidemiology transition from non-communicable disease now to rise in, in NCDs. Uh, the World Health Organization uh, estimate that NCDs, uh, including all those, this one I've listed here, uh, will rise by 27% over the next 10 years. This is much more higher than the expected global rise of 70%. So as far back as 1989 in Uganda, so we set up the general population courts that we call GPC. Uh, so since then, and every year, we have conducted an annual survey in this court uh, by administering questionnaire and as well as collecting biosample uh, in this population. So this uh, court uh, has approximately about 22,000 uh, people live there. Uh, in 2011, uh, so the research activity in GPC was broadened uh, to also include uh, non-communicable disease. In this particular study that I'll be talking about today, 5,000 people uh, were recruited 
for genetic epidemiology of NCDs. An additional 2,000 were recruited for our whole genome sequencing. So I'd like to mention that at the beginning of, of all our study uh, in this GPC, we start by first synthesizing the look at our leaders about the activities of the, of the, uh, of the research that we want to carry out. Uh, particularly, I'd like to mention that we have a committee that is called the Community Advisory Board, CAB, uh, which consists of stakeholders in that community, including leaders, pastors, imam, cultural leader, and also uh, scientists in our organization that make a decision and guide us on how research are carry out this community. So the point I would like to make here is that the, 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 in our own uh, GPC, uh, community engagement is really key for all our study. And there's an example of a recent uh, community engagement uh, trying to encourage the physical activity in this community. This was just as was well, just in the uh, last few months in January of this year. This is a cycling that was being encouraged uh, in the community. And here also is another example of uh, uh, community support that we, we do in our, in our community in, in Uganda. And this is another, another one. And here is another one just recently. So uh, in one of the NCD genetic epidemiology study that we did, uh, we observed that up to 80%, 80% of the participants have, that, that have hypertension were not even aware that they had hypertension. So we did the right thing uh, by providing feedback and supporting those participants, uh, particularly uh, those of them that consented to get uh, their feedback. So we think that engaging the participants are uh, providing feedback and creating an atmosphere of trust with mutual respect. They are key components of genomic study generally, especially in underrepresented population. So uh, for our NCD study, uh, we have mentioned what, what we recruited. We now incorporated a study for similar study from Africa, including study from South Africa, from Kenya, and other places, making a total of uh, about 14,700 participants. So as you can see here, uh, we measure a range of uh, cardiometabolic disease, including lipid traits, red blood cell liver function, and so on and, and so forth. Also infection, infection disease. So in order to demonstrate the value of African uh, genomes, uh, we published this work in Cell uh, in 2019. Uh, this study represents uh, one of the largest collection of gen genome study, GWAS, and whole genome sequencing in, in continent Africa. Um, that was uh, 2,000 uh, old genome se sequence and 5,000 uh, genotype. So as you may expect in that, in that study, uh, we find a higher level of uh, genetic diversity in the Uganda population. Specifically, we, we found 9.5 9 million uh, 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 novel SNPs that are not present in 1,000 genome uh, project phase three, African genome variation project, and as well as the UK 10,000. Uh, reference panel. So in that study, we also demonstrate the value of this African genome resource uh, by creating uh, a unique African reference panel with that 2000 uh, old genome sequence that I mentioned, and also uh, the data that are available publicly like the 1000 uh, genome project. So as you can see on this figure here on the top right uh, here, uh, you can see that our unique imputation reference panel had performed existing impression panel in terms of accuracy, especially where you put into East and South African population. So this slide is just to show uh, some of the novel genetic association that we found that are found to be associated with, uh, with a range of cardiometabolic traits. Uh, specifically, I would like to show here on the last uh, two columns here, uh, representing the minor frequency in African population and minor frequency in the uh, uh, in European population, what you will see in this uh, column is that the is this, these are mainly um, uh, is zero minor frequency. Uh, this is very important that the all this all this uh, genetic variant are absent in the European population. So meaning that uh, they will not have been found in the European population because they are they are absent in the European population. So it is important to emphasize that several of the studies have shown that African study uh, contribute an outsized number of genetic association relative to study of a similar study. And that's what we find here in the study of only 14,000 individuals in African population.
So our study also uh, leveraged on the lower naked disequilibrium in African data set. Uh, for the prime mapping analysis uh, resulted mainly in na narrow credible set like you, like you would expect. So we have now extended our study uh, by collaborating with uh, other colleagues uh, in the uh, with um, MVP cohort and as well as the UK UK Biobank. Uh, so in the MVP cohort, we have about 57,000 African American individual, and the UK Biobank has about 7,000 Black participants, and also with our our, our own um, our study of 14,000 individual in continental Africa. So uh, recently, uh, we performed this uh, PRS of type two diabetes. Uh, like you are aware, up to 60% of type 2 diabetes in Africa are undiagnosed, and this is very, very important. So what I would like to show here is that we are trying to compare PRS that derive from a uh, different uh, base data set, so including uh, multi-accessory meta-analysis of about 1.4 million individuals, uh, African-American uh, uh, GWAS of only 50,000, and type 2 diabetes, uh, European uh, Jewels of 1.1 uh, 1 million individuals. So these are the basic assets where PRS are derived, and they have been tested in the in South African population of only 2,500 individuals and being validated in a cohort that is called ADAM with uh, 4,300 uh, individuals. So this cohort called ADAM has got uh, individuals from Kenya, from Nigeria, and from Ghana. So this table shows the number of uh, type 2 diabetes cases and control in each of these, those base uh, discovery. Uh, like you can see here, we have uh, 200,000 cases for the multi-accessory, only 24,000 in African-American, and 140,000 in European population. And you can see the number of control uh, on top there. So the, the target data set, uh, which is for South Africa, like I mentioned, has uh, 1,600 cases, and 981 uh, control. Uh, what I want to show here is that the best predictive PRS from those three base database, uh, data, data, uh, data, uh, from those three uh, cohorts, they were all significant in South Africa uh, data set, which I should mention that. But what I want to show is, is that you see the highest variance of 1.1% as indicated by the R square and the p value of 3. Uh, 3.9 times 7 minus 9 was seen uh, from the African American derived PR, PRS here. Uh, you can see that uh, the, the, the variance is much higher than what you see from the multi accessory PRS and as well as the European PR, PRS. So, for validation, uh, which is here, uh, so validation also, we noted that the best PRS also were all, all significant. Uh, just in a similar trend has the target data set uh, in that uh, population in that population. Again, what I want to show here is that the African American derived PRS also performed better uh, in the validation data set compared to uh, multi accessory and as well as the European population. Uh, that is what I want to show from this uh, slide. So uh, we decided to evaluate the transferability of PRS uh, in different individual African countries. Uh, you know, I mentioned the validated data set uh, is from different countries. So we want to look at them uh, differently. So this bar plot is showing the transferability of African-American derived PRS in green, uh, the multi-accessory uh, PRS in yellow. Uh, and the, the African population is, uh, is Kenya, uh, Ghana, and Nigeria. They are from Adam at the Adam study. So as you may have noticed here, so the African-American uh, PRS were transferable in all the country uh, compared to the multi accessory that was not transferable in East Africa in Kenya, like you can see here. So this is important uh, to note uh, so that we don't make a generalization that multi accessory PRS uh, do better than the, uh, than the population specific uh, PRS. So again, uh, we show the model with the conventional risk factor of age, uh, BMI, the five, uh, P, uh, five uh, principal components, and sex, uh, they had an area under the curve, and that's a, a AUC of 67.9%, Why that of African-American PRS, uh, five PC, age, BMI, and sex was 
1.8%. So this uh, show an improved uh, discriminatory ability by 1.9%, with, uh, with the addition of the African American parents to the uh, conventional uh, risk factors. So to conclude on this, uh, what this is showing is that the African-American PRS is best predictor uh, for type 2 diabetes. Of course, this might be different for other, other pheno phenotypes. Um, so uh, similarly, we tested the performance of um, PRS for lipid traits. Um, in South Africa, uh, uh, Zulu data sets using the, again, the MVP summarized statistics. Um, so we show here that the African American derived price also enhanced uh, polygenic prediction of lipid trait in this South African population, just like we saw uh, previously for uh, type 2 diabetes. So we saw that the best performing uh, PRS is the LDL, like you can see from here. So an LDL is achieving a square of 8.14%. And the p value threshold of uh, five times 10 per minus eight. So, for all the lipid traits uh, using African American uh, derived PRS, so R square ranges from uh, the lowest one, which is uh, 0.87% uh, here from triglyceride uh, to 8.14% uh, for LDA. So, we noted that our PRS performance using LDA was much higher than, uh, than the performance reported previously from other studies. So we were excited about this, uh, about this result uh, uh, in South Africa. So we decided to also evaluate this in another African population. And here, yeah, the other African population was uh, 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 a core that I mentioned previously from the Uganda population. So uh, unfortunately, like I've highlighted here, so you see that our PRS position very greatly uh, when you compare to the South African population. You remember the LDL, the R square for LDL in the South African population was 8.14%. But for Uganda, unfortunately, that is 0.026%. So you, what I would like to mention here is that the difference uh, in terms of uh, uh, genetic and environmental uh, between Africa, between uh, South Africa and the uh, Uganda population. Uh, I should mention that the Uganda population is a rural community. The South African population is an urban community and diet is, is really key uh, for this. So collectively, our, our polygenic risk score studies show a need for improved representation of African in genomic study and also ensuring that generalization of finding for precision medicine is, uh, is key. So as we're all aware that uh, genomic studies are uh, predominantly based on population of African population. So as a result, the potential benefit of this will only be uh, for people of European population. And so what I want to emphasize here is that uh, when we mention the African uh, population, uh, so if you study trying to put it together, the African-American uh, Black participant in the UK and grouping all of that together into a broad category of African ancestry is not going to do anybody good. It's going to continue to promote imbalance and widen a disparity. So the truth is that the, uh, the uh, genomic data from continent African population is very, very scarce and there's need for uh, improvement. So here, yeah, so we chart a roadmap to increase diversity of uh, population of uh, genomic study, uh, which require a concerted uh, global effort. So we emphasize that there's a need for, uh, uh, for establishing um, uh, research infrastructure in the low-income country, uh, particularly the underrepresented population. Uh, so we advocate uh, for funding to maintain existing African uh, resources and as well as uh, other uh, underrepresented population. So here is just showing uh, what we propose in this paper that was recently uh, published. So one of the one of the uh, proposal is the need for partnership uh, and the partnership also including partnership with the uh, with the private co company. So about two years ago, so we established a, a private public partnership uh, with an African biotech company called Fifty Fortune, and the aim was to uh, to recruit about one hundred thousand people 
in, uh, in, in Nigeria across the cis, uh, geo, cis geopolitical zone across Nigeria. So here's just showing uh, the stories that are currently going on in Nigeria across different sites, across everywhere, all over in Nigeria. We think that this kind of, this kind of study and uh, this kind of uh, uh, partnership is really key uh, to help uh, narrow the current uh, genomic imbalance. So in conclusion, so Africa has a greater genetic diversity and such African genomic data and resources are key for precision medicine. So here, I believe that uh, in this presentation, I've shown you a model for engaging on that represented population in medical and genomic study. So I think that I've also uh, shown a model for utilizing small scale on the represented genomic uh, resources for novel ge uh, genetic discovery and disease free prediction. So uh, finally, uh, I think I'll, I'll, I'll propose a model to increase diversity for population genomic study, which require concerted global effort and partnership. So thank you very much for listening. I'm very happy to take any questions. Great, what a fantastic talk. And I see lots of questions coming in. So just, we've only really got one minute or so left of time. So I'm going to maybe condense a few questions uh, into one for to maximize our time. Uh, and basically a lot of the questions come back to this really exquisite work that you did to disentangle the uh, performance of different PRS in different African populations and subpopulations. So what is your thoughts or or ideas about the performance, particularly of the multi-ethnic PRS that just differs widely across different populations? So I uh, thank you very much for that question. Uh, what I would say is that um, we know that there is a great genetic diversity in Africa population. And as most people do group the African population together. If you look at the uh, web uh, in, in, in different multi-accessory uh, GWAS, uh, you, there's only one particular African population that is added in, into it. And if you look at the paper that I shared on that uh, presentation that was recently published in uh, uh, Nature Medicine, so we did mention that there are five uh, different broad uh, population of Africa, but in different uh, multi ancestry GWAS that is done, you only have one of them that has been there. And that, that one of them is mostly from West Africa, uh, probably from Nigeria and uh, other parts in Africa. So when we talk about uh, multi ancestry population and we talk about uh, Afri African-American individuals, it's very clear, uh, it's, it's good to be clear that uh, there are so many African that are being left behind, that are not being added to uh, GWAS that have been done. There was a paper that was published maybe last year by uh, Professor Ambrose Wokam, uh, which who was suggesting that uh, 3 million uh, African needs to be sequenced, and this has to be done across different ethnic groups in Africa. I completely agree with that uh, because there are so many African population that have been left behind that are not being included in, in, in current GWASs. Fantastic. I'd love to discuss this more, but we're, uh, we're out of time. I want to thank all the speakers in this fantastic session um, today and um, uh, encourage those whose questions I didn't get to ask you, please take them over to Slack. Um, uh, but otherwise, uh, this is the end of this session. We're now going into a 15 minute break and we will return at 10 minutes before the hour. Thank you very much. <laughs>